On today's show, I'm joined by Matt George of the Locked On Kings podcast to talk about our big takeaways from the Mavs-Kings game the other night, what the Mavs did right, what the Kings did wrong, and let's talk about the things they need to do to win on Friday. We'll talk about all that and more on today's Locked On Mavs. I'm Luka Doncic, and this is Locked On Mavericks podcast. I don't believe you shouldn't be here. Loyalty never fades away. And welcome. You are locked on to the Dallas Mavericks. My name is Nick Engstead, media member and NBA channel manager for the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for being part of the show, making Lockdown Maps your first listen today. But the best way you can help us grow the show is to listen every, every day on any podcast platform. Leave a five-star review, like the video, and comment anything below on YouTube. Let us know in the comment section what's one question you have about the Kings-Mavs game on Friday. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 Moneyline bet. That's $200 if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to get started. Today's show, we'll do one thing that Dallas needs to do to win on Friday, one thing Sacramento needs to do to win on Friday, and then Matt and I will ask questions back and forth about each of our teams. So let's get into it. All right, welcome in Nick Angstead from Locked On Mavs here with Matt George from Locked On Kings. And we're here to talk about Mavs versus Kings, this mini like playoff series that felt so contentious until the game was actually played. And then, and then the Mavs got the win, uh, shot an insane percentage from three. But we're going to do this. I'm going to ask questions about the Kings to Matt. Matt's going to ask questions to me about the Mavs. And then at the end, we'll share one thing that each team needs to do to win the next game, which is incredibly important. So, Matt, let's start with you. Ask me some questions about the Dallas Mavericks and their uh, 132 to 96 win over the Kings. Okay, question number one. I blacked out in the second half. What happened? <laughs> oh uh, my goodness gracious! So I'll, that was I'll tell you. The, I'll tell you the good news about it. Luka Doncic scored two points in the second half. That's, that's great, Kings defense, right? right? Is that, that, that what I the what I take away from that is Luka was a scrub in the second half. That, that's what he I was. take away from that. Luka was he could, absolutely not good. Kings shut him down. Benched in the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jason Kidd. They, hey, guess what? You, Luka. you know what? They don't need Luca. No, they don't. Marvin Bagley would have had 30 last night. I just want that to be known. <laughs> just 30 seconds played. That's what I mean. Or 30 Marvin injuries. Bagley. Regardless, <laughs> oh. hey, man. Like, look, I expect Dallas Mavericks fans to take their victory laps. I will say this. Raccoon Squad, get the hell out of my comment section, you bunch of trash <laughs> pandas. <laughs> you absolute jerk. Squad Nick Angston sent me. Go away. Go the away. Squad right? coming through strong last Score, night in the comment section. Scoreboard still says 2 1. Okay. That's 2 right. 1 Sacramento Kings. Although Very ultimate true. bragging rights go to the Mavs right now because they're ahead in the standings. I get that. Friday's game is massive. What yes. I want to start with is this. Um, I mean, the Kings, what they've done recently a lot better, Nick, is defend the three point shot. That has been like the bane of their existence this season. They've been giving up way too high percentages from three. The eight games before last night's loss to the Mavericks, they've done a much better job defending the three. Guys not named Luca and Kyrie went 14 of 22 from three point range last night. Should I, I guess, should Kings fans or should the Kings themselves feel pretty confident that they can't? hope that this is what's going to happen for them to win on Friday, but should they feel pretty confident that the Mavericks aren't going to be able to shoot that well? The supporting cast is not going to be able to shoot that well again. I'm going to go full politician with this answer. So I'm going to answer with the thumb as well, pointing Uh, (laughs) yes and no. So the answer is, the answer is of course not. Like I I would not, I did not expect them to shoot that well. Now the Mavericks were due for a good shooting game. They had Mm -hmm. solid three point shooters like Tim Hardaway, you know, Luca, Kyrie, whoever, just not shooting well at all. Even PJ Washington has been shooting like 19% from three in the last couple of weeks. Just, you know, he's an, he's normally like a 35% three point shooter, but just shooting way under his numbers. And so the maps were due for some kind of regression. They just got it all in one game, basically from all these guys. The other, the thing about it though, that like, yes, the maps aren't going to shoot that well from three in the next game, probably. But the other thing is the maps have won games not shooting the three ball well since these trades before the Mavericks made the trades for PJ Washington and for Daniel Gafford. And I say, I say a lot of things on lockdown Mavs now pre-trade and post trades because it's yep. just completely changed the entire complex of this team, right? The Mavericks before the trades this season were Owen seven in games. They shot under 30% from three mm. since then. I think they're six and two now because they won a game the other night in games where they shot under 30% from three. So they're shooting under 30% from three in like a lot of the games that they've played since then, but they find uh, they find other ways to win. And so, yes, the three-point shooting is going to come back down to earth, but 
they do find other ways to win. They get in the paint. They have the pick and roll threats all the time. They get out in transition. They score, you know, fast break points. I know the Kings didn't do a lot of that last night, but uh, the Mavs, like they score points off turnovers. Like they just find different ways to score. And then Luca and Kyrie can give them just enough. And so th- the three point shooting is kind of one of the big focuses. And it kind of is for the Mavs too, to try and get like, all right, can we get any kind of three point shooting? Cause it just hasn't been great so far, even though they've been finding ways to win without it. A couple of things stood out to me from from the Kings post game perspective. I'll present them both to you, each with a question attached. The first one is the Kings were caught off guard a little bit or caught by surprise with how Dallas defended them. It's no surprise that the Kings are trying to get downhill. They're trying to touch the paint, get spray threes, which is a pillar of Mike Brown's offense, something that the Mavericks did an excellent job of. Mike was talking last night, like the Mavericks beat the Kings at their game last night with the fast break, the spray threes, everything. But but what the Mavericks did that the Kings were pointing out a lot that they didn't necessarily expect was they were defending high. They were coming up. Gafford, wh- whoever it was, the bigs were coming up and and, and playing high and, and forcing the Kings to, to scramble a little bit and not really get into their offense starting at the perimeter, not just in the paint, where, of course, the defense would then collapse if the Kings tried to get inside, which is normal. What did you see? Did you see anything that the Mavs did differently defensively last night to what they normally do, or were the Kings just not prepared for a, a, a Mavs style of defense last night? The Mavs defense has been predicated for, oh my gosh, years now it seems it seems like predicated on effort and predicated on all right we have this rotating defense where we're going to you know rotate and help help over here and then the guy that's farthest away has to run over and rotate and like when the Mavericks aren't putting in that effort when Luca or Kyrie or Tim Hardaway Jr. or somebody I'm not going to name names even though I just did when somebody doesn't put in the right effort and like rotate to the guy that they're supposed to the defense completely falls apart and just like the bottom falls out and so the Mavs very recently had a stretch where they lost five of six games and they played two games against the Pacers where their defense looked like like not an NBA defense at all. Like it looked like, I mean, it was worse than the wizards. Basically it was, it was terrible to watch. It didn't look like any of their fundamentals were there. It didn't look like the Mavs were even trying. And so I was at the point where I was like, man, they've got to, they've got to change something, get this right. Something coaching staff is not getting any kind of semblance of defense out of this group. And if that's going to be the case, then get rid of Jason Kidd now because this team's never going to win if they don't. And then they've completely changed it around since then. And they always have kind of had this, in the Luka era, they've kind of had this, like, all right, we're going to turn it on a little bit on defense because it's predicated on effort. It's predicated on finishing plays, getting rebounds. They've gotten much better as a rebounding team since the trades, you know, adding Gafford. So they have Lively or Gafford on the court at all times. P.J. Washington's a bigger wing than Grant Williams was. And so finishing plays, putting in that right kind of effort, I think that's been the big thing that that changed. I don't know that I saw anything schematically against the Kings that was, like, very different than what the Mavs have done. The thing that kind of stood out to me that I talked about in in on Locked On Mavs is I thought like Derek Lively did a great job on Sabonis in the third I quarter. Agree. I agree. Sabonis like three or four times tried to take it to him in the post, and yep. after Lively bit on that pump fake in the first quarter that was just like really embarrassing, uh, he didn't bite on it at all after that and just did a really good job defending him. What did you What did you see on that side of it um, from like them defending Sabonis? Well, I thought they were patient to your to your point about not biting on the pump fakes, but I thought what they did a very good job of is is they swarmed the basketball. Sabonis likes to initiate contact. He likes to play physical. They they played straight up. They they took it in the chest, even though some of you people like to take that and run with it and pretend he plays dirty when he absolutely does not. He is the pushiest player in the NBA. He he plays a physical... Pushes also per minute a, is like the highest, I think. He is undersized as a center. And you can't be talking yeah. about pushes when Luka Doncic uses a stiff arm every time he, he dribbles the basketball. De'Aaron <laughs> Fox a stiff gets shoulder. called it's for a stiff it. shoulder. <laughs> Sorry, stiff, stiff shoulder. Fox gets called for it, and Luka doesn't, by the way. But we are not. We don't have to go down that rabbit hole. But to answer your question, I thought the Mavs did a good job of staying patient with Sabonis, uh, swarming Sabonis when he got deep position, and then doing a good job of cutting off the passing lane so Sabonis couldn't get the ball out. And even when he did get the ball out, the Kings weren't knocking down shots. So they were they were making the right gamble of daring someone to beat them on the perimeter. It was the right call last night. But the other thing post-game that, that stood out to me, Nick, that I wanted to ask you about really quickly, and I talked about this a lot on Locked on Kings, Mike Brown and I kind of flipped the script last night because a lot this season I've talked about Man, the defense, the defense is bad, but the offense, man, the offense is what the Kings yeah. are known for, and it just hasn't been good enough. And Mike's been typically answering my questions with, 
I, like the offense is fine. Defensively, we got to be better. We got to be better. Last night, Mike Brown said, we lost this game because of our offense. The Kings gave up 130 plus points, but he's saying we lost because of our offense. And he said the Kings offense led to a lot of the offensive opportunities, led to a lot of the rhythm for the Dallas Mavericks. I'm curious, the way you look at that game, the, the Kings got beat on both ends of the floor. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. But where did you see the biggest weakness for Sacramento was on the offensive or defensive end or what caught you by surprise that the Mavs were able to dominate more. Yeah, I was surprised by the the Kings offense too. I I heard you say that on the, on the post game show. And I was surprised that the Kings, uh, I felt like they settled for a lot of shots. Felt like they, you know, in the second quarter, it felt like Fox had started to get into a rhythm and figuring out how to get to his spots and and pull up for floaters. And then I thought, okay, the Mavs are going to have to adjust here and then they'll kick out to, to shooters. But when the Mavs are rotating and, like they got lucky on a couple of you know a couple of shots. Kings what shot thirty six percent from three, but they only took thirty. Like it didn't feel like the Kings were playing their their own style of offense. Really, Correct. Uh, the Mavs were were very physical with them. I was joking you know, earlier. We were joking earlier about the the pushing back and forth, but it was a very physical game, and the refs let them let them away with a lot of stuff last night. Like a lot of stuff under the, the rim and all that, and then the perimeter. If you grabbed somebody, it felt like it was a foul. It was like a very very weirdly officiated game in that way, mm-hmm. but. Yeah, I was surprised by the by the Kings offense because uh yeah, I just kept waiting for them to go on some kind of run and I think I think a lot of it was the transition offense. Like the Mavs transition defense was there and the Kings didn't get any easy baskets where the Mavs were on the other end. Like you get a, a little bit of a run starting when like Kyrie beats everybody on the floor, Lively beats everybody and Luka hits him with a pass down the floor and you get a couple of those easy buckets that way. It really started to snowball for him. And so coming up, let's talk about the the King side of this. Let's talk about, I want to know what was the most concerning part of the Kings loss last night, looking towards that Friday matchup between these two teams. Talk about all that and more coming up. Today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Could be another win for the Mavs. Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to that next level. So check out the 2024 Nissan Rogue. Perfect. For City Drive's Great Escapes, it has the class-exclusive Google built-in, your always-updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of trying to connect your phone, fumbling around. The Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. Go check one out today. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. Also, check out the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder. Room for up to eight in an expansive cargo capacity, advanced available 4x4 capability, with 284 horsepower, up to 6,000 pounds of towing. When Adventure calls, the Pathfinder is there to answer. Take the Nissan Rogue, the Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop at NissanUSA.com. Again, NissanUSA.com. Also want to tell you about Amazon Fire TV. It's your destination for sports, live games, highlights, in-depth analysis from all kinds of great content. Like Locked On, we are there on Amazon Fire TV. Go to AmazonFire.com or Amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV. Amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV to see all the kinds of stuff. They have millions of movies, TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball, the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. You can get it on a lot of different smart TVs. You can also get it on the Amazon Fire Stick. You can just plug it into a TV, and all of a sudden, your TV becomes a smart TV. So you can get that as well. Check out the Fire TV and Fire TV uh, channels and the uh, Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels yet, you should trust us on this. Locked On has their own channels. Locked On Sports Today, Locked On Sports Dallas, Locked On Sports Los Angeles, all kinds of good stuff. To learn more, visit amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV. All right, back here, Locked On Mavs, Locked On Kings crossover. My turn now. Turn the tables on Matt George. We're going to talk about the, uh, I, wanna, I have questions about the Kings and about the Kings side of it. What was your most concerning thing after that game uh it's 132 to 96 loss but what's the what's the most concerning thing you look at and go man like this is not who we are or this is what i'm most concerned about against this maps team in a game that's coming up again well first off bringing up the final score wasn't necessary and i take that as an offense so we, we don't have to talk we don't have to it's over were to you the con- past. were you concerned by the final score <laughs> uh, just a little i mean a wee bit you know biggest game of the year and you almost lost by 40 points no big deal Oof. but i mean Funny enough, Nick, like if you had listened to Locked on Kings a week and a half ago when the Kings lost on the road to the Washington Wizards, I blew a gasket on that postgame show. As you and, should. And the Kings have lost to the, the Wizards. They've lost to 
the um the Rockets three times and the Rockets are a pretty decent team now they're not in the same category as the Wizards they've lost to the Hornets they've lost uh, to some of the worst teams in the NBA one of the few teams in the league that have lost to everybody in the cellar except for the San Antonio Spurs at this point so they've had some losses that were I think way worse than last night's loss despite the fact that it was only a four or six point loss versus a 36 point loss right there was a lot about last night's game that I'm really not majorly concerned about because the Kings have had a pattern consistently. I, I need Mavs fans to understand this. This is not cockiness. The Kings have gotten blown out multiple times this season and almost every single time, except for one that I can remember, they've responded well. So the mm -hmm. expectation in Sacramento on Friday is that there is going to be a good response. That doesn't mean that the Kings are going to win, but that means that what the King, what, what the Mavericks saw from the Kings on Tuesday, I don't think is going to be similar at all to what they see on Friday. Now, if the Mavs beat the Kings down again, then we got some alarm bells going off. Right. But what, I guess what concerned me the most, Nick, and I talked about this last night too, last season, the Kings offensively showed that they can, outscore anybody and they can go on these unstoppable stretches and on these unstoppable runs where even Kevin Durant was going on his podcast going like, what do we do? The offense this season just is not the same. Now, the good news is the defense has gotten better. And in the playoffs, which is ultimately what this season's about, in the playoffs, the Kings' offense wasn't good against the Warriors. Their defense is what made that a seven, a best of seven series. So the Kings are kind of preparing for that now with the way that they've been playing. But when the Kings went down 12, then 14, then 16 in the third quarter, even though they're more than capable of rattling off a 10-0 run and getting right back into it, me being there, the energy in the building was, God, I don't think the Kings are going to be able to string anything together tonight. So the biggest concern for, with me, Nick, to answer your question is offensively, it feels like the Kings have lost that firepower and that that ruthlessness that they had last season that teams feared. It also happens to to be a second season to where now teams aren't caught by surprise anymore. Kings know yeah, what, right. or rather teams know what the Kings are bringing. So my concern is is definitely on the offensive end of this, uh, this team's ability to work themselves out of a big hole when they put themselves into one. Yeah, that was the thing I noticed about this. I've noticed about this Kings team overall is they're three points per hundred possessions worse offensively than they were last season. Last season, yeah. kind of unsustainable, almost 120 points per hundred possessions. <laughs> this season, 117. But they went from the, the but the NBA though has completely caught up offensively. Correct. Last year the Kings were first. This year they dropped three points, which you're like, okay, three points. That's like not a ton. 14th. They're like an average offense this season, 117 points per hundred possession, which used to be one of the greatest marks in NBA history. Why? Right. What's been the biggest difference between the Kings offense last year and this year? One, I think, again, teams are not caught by uh, surprise with Sacramento. Two yeah. is I think this Kings team has overestimated themselves as a three-point shooting team. On paper, this team looks like a team that's stacked with shooters, but this Kings team lives and dies by the three-point shot. And it's not so much that they're chucking from three, although they've done that from time to time. It's And this is what Mike Brown has pointed out a lot. The quality of threes that they've been getting in a lot of games just hasn't been up to par. Like last night, for example, spray threes, which is paint touches, getting yeah. into the paint and then kicking it out from three. Mike's goal is for the Kings to generate 20 spray three attempts a game, and he can live with the results, right? In the first half, the Kings were five of 10 from spray threes, 50% on 10 generated looks. That's really, really good. That's why they were only down six, despite Luka yeah. Doncic going MVP mode. In the second half, they were one for four. So three-point shooting is the, in so many ways, the lifeblood of this Kings offense. You'd think it'd be pace and transition, and it still is because their transition usually leads to a lot of spray threes and good looks. But if this team is cold from the perimeter, they really, really struggle to win. Now, what we've seen recently is they can survive a little bit better being cold from three-point range with this newfound offense, with, which is predicated on physicality. And the Kings played physical last night, but the Mavericks carved up that physicality in the second half, which is why the Kings ended up where they were at. The other thing, I, the, the stat I've been monitoring for the Mavs is, is points in the paint, and the Kings only scored 38 points in the paint, which is a, mm -hmm. a really big thing as well. I'll talk, we'll talk about that a little bit later when I talk about one thing the Mavs need to do. Um, but I want to talk about the, the Kings defense. So you, you talked about this new newfound defense for the, for the Kings. They've had some really good defensive games the last couple of weeks. Uh, when they're defending well, what are they doing right? Like what are the, what are the principles or what are the things that the, this Kings defense does when you're like, Oh, it's working. Like it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. They go back to the basics. 
And, and what I mean by that is Mike Brown has talked about this a lot. Mike Brown and the Kings had to spend time in practice this year going over basic closeouts on defense. Now that sounds like, yeah. wow, that's kind of pathetic because that's something like a, a high five closeout on the perimeter is, is what the Kings have had to work on. This is basic stuff you learn in high school or earlier than that, right? Which is closing out on a shooter, not running into them, but going past them to the side and trying to essentially high five them at the shot, top of their jump shot without making contact, right? That's the best way you can close out. The Kings have done a much better job closing out from the perimeter because the reality is, and Mike pointed this out earlier, if the Kings were average with their perimeter defense, we're talking 15th, 16th, 17th in the league, they'd be a top 10 defense. But because they are one of the worst, if not the worst, three-point defensive team in the league, they're in the bottom half. In the month of March, they've been doing a significantly better job with closeouts, with defending the perimeter. So it all starts there. The Dallas Mavericks won that game last night because they could not miss from three-point range, number one. But number two, Sacramento was not doing a good enough job trying to run them off the three-point line. They naturally had to give shooters space because when you're guarding Kyrie and you're guarding Luka Doncic, it's help, 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 which is... Usually a, a an advantage that the Kings have with De'Aaron Fox and Malik Monk on the other end of the floor. So I understand that very well. There's only so much you can do. You have to help out on those two ball handlers, but you have to do a better job closing out from the perimeter, which the Kings did not do. That's been a, a really, that's been a major success of this Kings team uh, as of late. And it was nowhere to be found last night. Coming up, let's talk about one thing the Mavs need to do, one thing the Kings need to do to get the win on Friday. And then I kind of want to talk about how each team views the playoff picture right now because it is kind of insane where they are right now. So let's talk about that coming up. Today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. BetterHelp is there to help you in a time of need or when you just have some anxiety to work on. Everybody ha needs the opportunity to just get something off your chest. So you want to talk to somebody that's going to be unbiased. You want to talk to somebody that's going to be uh, there for you, that's 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 scheduled that you know that you're like all right i'm really struggling this week but i have this thursday set up that i can talk to somebody sometimes that's a lifeline that you need i've been in that place where man i'm just waiting around for that therapy session to happen so i can get this all off my chest therapy can be different for everybody but most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports teams like the kings losing it's important to get things off your chest every once in a while if you're thinking about starting therapy give better help a try it's entirely online designed to be flexible suited to your schedule so visit betterhelp.com slash locked on nba get 10 percent off your first month again that's better help help.com slash locked on nba to check out better help today all right matt let's talk about the uh, let's talk about one thing each team needs to do to get a win on Friday. I think for the Mavericks, I mentioned this earlier, the points in the paint. The Kings this season, including last night's game, are 4-16 and 16 when they score under 45 points in the paint. The Mavs held them to 38 last night, and so if they can contain the paint, they contain Sabonis, they contain those spray threes in a, in a way, like, all right, mm -hmm. we're, we're not allowing you to have this, and just, all right, you got to beat us on the three. You got to do the same thing the Mavs did to the Kings. You have to hit 56% from three or whatever. Uh, I think they need to contain... The paint again. That I think that's a real, real key for the Mavericks. And with two centers in Gafford and Lively that I thought played pretty well last night, uh, even with the fouls and everything, I thought that they did a great job. And they got that done last night. I think they can do it again on Friday. Yeah, I, I mean, I 100% I agree with you. Now, the Kings have actually, weirdly enough, this is like the third game in recent memory that the Kings have had less than 40 points in the paint. And I mean, that's been kind of a theme of this stretch as of late. And I think it also goes to the universal game plan that the Mavericks are privy to and every team was privy to, which is swarm the paint, muddy up the paint and force yeah. Sabonis to play as physical as he has to and, and not let the Kings get those paint touches and get that success around the rim that they're used to. So it's an absolute right game plan for Jason Kidd, force the Kings to beat it. And the Kings have not always consistently been able to do so. They found cracks before, and a lot of it has to do with the three-point shooting. If you can knock down your threes and force the defense to spread out a little bit more, get Malik Monk going, because Malik was not good last night. If Malik, Malik is shooting the way that Malik's capable of shooting, you can't necessarily play that defense like the Mavs played all the time. So you're you're spot he on had, there. He had that alley oop though that was. I He's, thought for sure that alley oop in the third quarter. I thought for sure was going to like spark a run where all of a sudden it kind of did. They went on like a seven zero run or something at the end of the third. Mm -hmm. But I thought that was about to spark like oh god here here come the Kings they're coming back. That's what we were all hoping for too. And then uh, oh. yeah, that, and then that five zero start for the Mavericks to the fourth quarter. It was like all right, turn yeah. out the lights pretty quickly. Yeah. So the Mavs did a fantastic job of stopping things before they could get even close to getting out of hand. And I give them credit for. For me, again, I'm going to go on the defensive end. Even though the offense was not good enough at all, don't let the supporting cast beat you. 
If Luca and Kyrie beat you by combining for 90 points, okay. <laughs> but you can't let PJ Washington, you can't let Gafford, you can't let Lively. Tim Hardaway Jr., I'm naturally terrified of because he's that he's that archetype of player that typically cooks the Kings. Mavs so, fans are scared of Tim Hardaway Jr. too. <laughs> I, that, I, look, I understand that. But he's, he's that archetype. He's been good the last two games. Though. So don't let the Mavs supporting cast beat you again. Right, you can live with Luca and Kyrie, and the way it was shaping up, I was thinking, okay, this is going to be a close game. Luca's going to be going for fifty, and it might come down to Luca just hitting a couple big shots down the stretch, and you're just like, okay, tip your cap. I'm, I, you can't live with. I don't expect the Mavs to go fourteen to twenty-two again, but at the same time, don't give them twenty-two good freaking looks and hope <laughs> that they're going to miss. Right, so for me, it's it's limit the supporting cast as much as possible. If you do that. Even if the game is close, the Kings aren't going to win by a blowout by any means. But if you do that, then Sacramento has more than their fair chance of, of winning that game. Yeah, the legs for Sacramento, too. You had played five and what, seven, seven days nights, or something like that. Yeah. I mean, that that affected the defense, too. And that, that affected the snowball of it, I think, too, where maybe the Mavs, like if they had been more rested, maybe the Mavs win that game by 10 instead of like 36 or whatever. But yeah, I think that affected that. So I don't think it was as like, oh, the Mavericks are two heads better than, you know, <laughs> better than, than the Kings, you know? Yeah. Um, I think the, the Kings also played a little bit last night, Nick, and now this isn't acceptable by any means. I think the Kings played last night. Like they knew they had another crack at it and they only needed one for the tiebreaker. Like yeah, that's right. the Kings kind of played last night. Like Mike Brown emptied the bench with six minutes I, left. Granted, yeah, you were right. down <laughs> 40, so whatever, but you had tired legs. There's no reason to keep them out there. Like the Kings know that Friday's a massive game. So I expect Sacramento to look significantly different and more engaged on Friday. I also expect the Mavs to expect that. So I think Friday is going to be a more accurate look of how close these two teams are and how major of a battle it is. That could also be wishful thinking after a 36 point loss. But look, these two teams are neck and neck for a reason. They both are loaded with talent. They both have supporting casts that can be rain or shine or, or good or bad. We just don't know on, on any given night. So there's a reason why these two teams are where they're at in the standings right now. And I think it, it leads to good for all of us as an audience. Hopefully we get a more oh. entertaining basketball game. Well, the first half, at least I was fully entertained by it. And, right. and the, the rest of it, I was too. But like as a, as a basketball fan, the energy, like what was the atmosphere like in, in the arena? Did it feel like it was a, a playoff-esque atmosphere uh, yes and no um i mean I, I think kings fans knew that that it was a big game and there was decent energy in the first half there was also a lot of i think luca was just so brilliant in the first half too the kings fans were just like wow but the mavs did after this game well shut up the mavs did a masterful job you can stop that by the way it's been enough time the kings are fine nick it's been <laughs> enough time okay shut up didn't and, think you heard me no go away uh <laughs> honestly the the Mavs did a fantastic job of taking that crowd out of it and limiting the energy that the 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 Kings get and feed off from that crowd but oddly enough the Kings have been better on the road the last two seasons at generating their own energy than they've been at home which is strange so uh, we'll just have to wait and see how that goes on Friday how did the Kings look at the the playoff picture right now because for the Mavs for the Mavs, it's like, all right, you got to get to six because you just don't want anything, any part of that play in. But like, if they're in a play in, I don't know. I feel like the Mavs could win one of those games now with the way that they play. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like, all right, we're looking at got to get to six. And then, like, what I guess let's do it this way. Is there like a team that the Kings are scared of in the play in or the like the lower section of the, the West standings right now? All of them. And I, I say that not wild. I say that not to roll because the idea of the play in terrifies me and should terrify the Kings because the Kings are more than capable of beating anybody on any given night. They've also proven they're more than capable of losing to anybody on any given yeah, night. I mean, that's just, Mavs. that's just sports in a nutshell, but the idea of the Kings are a significantly better team than the golden state warriors. The Kings own the Los Angeles Lakers, but you invite either of those teams into your building for a one game playoff. What's to stop 40. Steph from going for 50? What's to stop free throws? What's the, yeah. What's to stop LeBron? It's basically a game seven. Anything can happen. Yeah. The play in is terrifying to me. And we just got an example. Imagine if it was Kings and, 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 and Mavericks in the play in last night, the Mavs just rolled Sacramento in a one game. 
Meanwhile, the Kings are up 2-1 on a series. If it was Kings-Mavs in a best-of-seven series, I like the Kings better in that situation, although those two teams are way evenly matched compared to Kings and Lakers or Kings-Warriors, in my opinion. But the play in, in general scares the crap out of me, Nick, because... At that point, it comes down to one game. Anything can, it's like NCAA March Madness. And when you have teams in the play in right now that are loaded with talent that might be sunsetting on their careers, but is capable of having that Hall of Fame type performance on any given night, and the stage is big. I don't know how Sacramento fares in that versus if the Kings got a shot at the Lakers in a best of seven series, I think the Kings would win in five or six because they own them in that way. So, the Kings making the sixth seed and going into the playoffs outright should be a very major sense of urgency, in my opinion. I don't know if the Kings treat it the same way, but I'm terrified of the plan. Yeah, the plan, if the Mavs are in the plan and it's Mavs, Suns, Lakers, Warriors, how insane is that? It's it's Luka, Kyrie, Booker, Durant, LeBron, AD, and Steph. The NBA is thrilled, the plan. Holy the NBA cow. loves it. The NBA is like, this is exactly what we wanted, man. It's it's huge. Those are massive games every single night. So the Kings want to avoid that, please. The Mavs are only a game back now from the Pelicans and the Clippers play tonight. So we'll mm -hmm. see what happens with that. But they're only a game and a half out of the Clippers, too. And like the 4-5 is not completely out of the picture. And if the Mavs can go 4-5, even if Denver is one, if the Mavs go 4-5 and it's Clippers or Pelicans, where Pelicans are maybe without Brandon Ingram and Clippers have not looked like a playoff team in the last couple of weeks, I mean, that that's where their their sights are, I think, right now. Um, so, Good. All right, let, let's avoid Good. that. Do me a favor. You pay attention to 4-5 and don't worry too much about Friday. And then when Friday comes around, Sacramento will well, be they gotta, ready to... Sacramento's got to They got to keep winning every game in front of them. I mean, that's the thing is that you can't overlook any team. Uh, King's schedule down those down the stretch is pretty tough though, right? Uh, yes, but at the same time, that's almost more encouraging because the Kings tend to play well. <laughs> they just, they just tell me that they lost the Wizards and the Hornets. This is what the Mavericks have done well that the Kings have not in this race, which is the Mavs are winning the games that they're supposed to win. Two straight yeah. games in Utah. I know the second one was a little testy at times, but they found a way to win both those games. The Kings had a decent road trip. They beat Toronto. They beat Orlando, but losing to Washington, that's the difference right now in the standings, or at least half a game difference right now in the standings. So like the, the Mavs have done a really, really good job of handling the games that they're supposed to win. And that is something that the Kings have struggled with, not just this season, Nick, they've struggled with that for 20 years. Then again, there haven't been a lot of games that they were supposed to win over the last 20 years. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, before, yeah, that's, that's insane. Uh, is there a key player down the stretch that you're watching for the Kings? Like this guy's got to step it up or this guy's got to be good the rest of the way. I mean, the Kings are so reliant upon how their main three, which is Fox, Sabonis, and Monk do. But I think Keegan Murray is a big part of this as well because Keegan has 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 developed into, into a significantly better defender than I think we expected at this point. That being said, the Kings need more out of Keegan offensively. And mm -hmm. like my to me, my number is average 17 plus points a game for the remainder of this season and going through the playoffs. If you get that from Keegan with the four, five, six rebounds that he'll probably hopefully give you and then the better defense you should be okay. So I think just getting a consistent near 20 points per game from Keegan on a nightly basis is going to be a big difference in the Kings offense, getting back to what they're capable of being. Yeah. For the Mavs outside of Luca and Kyrie, it's PJ Washington. His defense has been transformational for the Mavericks. Fantastic. I thought he did a, a great job last night. And then he has not hit corner threes well at all. Like he just mm -hmm. cannot hit corner threes. And he started the game last night with three threes, like off of pick and pops, which I've been calling for for forever. Run PJ Washington in the pick and roll. So you get, you know, a better, like he, maybe the, maybe they double Luca, which they did every time. And then all of a sudden you get a wide open shot for PJ. And so if he hits some of those shots, I'm really watching him down the stretch for the Mavs. There you go. Go listen to Locked On Kings. Uh, go listen to Locked On Mavs. We will both have episodes after the game on Friday as well. So win or lose. Another huge game for both teams, and we'll see what happens with them. Guys, thanks for listening to Lockdown Mavs, Lockdown Kings. Screw you, Raccoon Squad. Boom.